following this vision of the grim and foreboding portals of hell and of the shadow realm of limbo, Francis, the holy handmaid of the Lord, was then led to the lower regions of the inferno, where multifarious and gruesome torments were carried out as the apt punishments for various particular sins of the most grave and grievous variety. Needless to say, her gentle soul was utterly stupefied and terrified by all that she witnessed there. Firstly, she was taken to the place where those who were guilty of what are customarily described as sins against nature received their eternal chastisement. This place of torment was located in one of the nethermost and darkest pits of hell, and it served as the everlasting home of those depraved souls who had indulged in sexual lusts and perversities contrary to the good and wholesome ordering of divine and natural law. Here were crowds of demons, each bearing in their claw-like hands heated rods resembling iron javelins, which glowed with red-hot intensity. Upon one of these instruments of torment, the soul of each depraved malefactor and pervert was impaled, the spear entering through the posterior orifice. This fiery spear was then drawn out through the mouth of the condemned wretch, passing through their entire body either quickly and violently, or with excruciating and protracted slowness. And from this hideous and ever-repeated process, there was neither rest nor respite. But this was not the only form of punishment taking place. For as varied and bizarre are the acts of human perversity, lust, and sexual abuse, so correspondingly varied were the tortures which were inflicted upon those guilty of them. In truth, both these crimes and their punishments can scarcely be decently repeated or recorded in writing but are best left to the imagination of any who dare to imagine them. The whole area was filled with fetid foulness, rank, unspeakable miasmas, and scorching fires and chilling winds. The air echoed with blasphemous and agonized exclamations, which were reiterated without end. Francis, whose soul was pure and whose heart was innocent, was almost overcome with shock and horror at what she witnessed there. But her celestial companion and protector, the Archangel Raphael, held her trembling hand with comforting strength and urged her to take courage. Next, Francis saw the place, located in one of the lowest regions of hell, where corrupt money lenders and those guilty of the crime of usury are tormented. Their bodies were laid upon a burning, fiery counting table, and their limbs forcibly stretched out. However, though their limbs were extended, they did not assume the form of a cross, for, as Raphael explained to her, that holy sign or form was not permitted anywhere in hell. Demons stood all around them with vessels filled with molten gold and silver. They poured this gleaming and scalding liquid down the throats of each of the tormented souls. And with sharp implements, they carved a kind of deep incision and pit in the flesh of each one, in close proximity to the hearts of their victims, and similarly poured the molten precious metals into this bleeding opening. As they did so, the demons declared with cruel mockery and bitter derision, O wretched, avaricious souls! Remember how desperately you longed for gold and silver while you lived. Recall how closely you always held these gleaming metals to your insatiable and miserly hearts. Well, now you may have your fill of it, and more. The servant of God, Francis, was utterly astonished at this most grisly and gruesome sight. She was also somewhat perplexed at how apparently physical objects and tools, such as knives and metal vessels, were able to exist and be used in hell. But her companion angel, Raphael, explained that these things appeared in her vision to be such, but they were not, in reality, physical things at all. Rather, they represented, through the medium of physical images, the spiritual torments which the souls there experienced. The souls of those guilty of the crimes of usury and financial exploitation were, after a time, removed from the burning counting table on which they had been stretched and tormented. They were then immersed in glass vessels which were similarly filled with molten gold or silver. 
they would remain in one vessel for a certain period of time, suffering unspeakable scorching and pains all the while, and then be removed and placed into another. In this way, no form of rest or respite was ever possible for them, for they could not grow accustomed to any one location or condition. And they, like all the other tormented souls, continually cried forth in a litany of mournful, lugubrious sixteen lamentations and hideous and heinous blasphemies. Francis then looked around and noticed the continual procession of souls entering hell and being led to their fitting places of suffering. She noticed that each one had upon his or her forehead a sheet of paper or card upon which the catalogue of the sins of which he or she had been convicted was inscribed. Thus, she was able to read clearly and exactly what each one was guilty of, and not only this, but by some form of revelation, she could perceive into the very depths of their being, to see and fully comprehend all the misdeeds and atrocities which weighed on their consciences. But this grace was granted to her alone, for these cards placed upon the foreheads of the damned were not visible to any other condemned souls. She noticed also that every condemned soul had two demons assigned to it. One of these demons was employed in carrying out the actual punishments, such as those described in the course of this narration. But the task of the other one was to remind the wretched sufferers of their sins and crimes, and also of all the good deeds they had neglected to do. In this way, each condemned soul suffered in a double sense, both from the torments afflicted upon it, and a continually renewed sense of guilt and shame. This oppressive and unrelenting sense of guilt and shame was accompanied by a poignant and painful regret at the loss of the joys of heaven, which so easily could have been attained by a few timely works of piety and penance performed while mortal life had endured. Next, Francis was transported to the dreadful and darksome abode where those stubborn and miserable souls who had blasphemed against God and his holy saints were compelled to dwell and there to suffer ceaseless scourges and sorrows as a just retribution. Here, there were demons who bore ghastly pincers in their nefarious and agile hands. With these grim instruments of satanic surgery, they would deftly extract the tongue of each blasphemer and cast it still writhing like some hideous, headless worm, upon a pit of burning coals which was nearby. Then, with the same pincers, the demons would take some of these coals and stuff them into the bleeding, toneless mouth of the blasphemer. Next, they would seize the entire body of their victim and immerse it in a vat of heated oil, smoking and boiling with fiendish ebullience. Then, taking up a vessel of this same superheated oil, they would mercilessly pour it down the throat of the blasphemer. The demonic torturers would add mockery and scorn to these torments, saying, O oh, miserable and deluded soul, how could you dare to blaspheme the holy name of your Creator? With your mouth you insulted him, and now that same despicable mouth is filled with pain. Yes, now you pay the price for your blasphemy, and you shall keep on paying it, over and over again forever and ever, for aeons without number. In close proximity to the impious and arrogant souls of the blasphemers were all those who had denied the Catholic faith while they lived, because of cowardly fear of punishment or persecution, or for desire for some worldly advancement. These did not suffer quite so grievously as those guilty of deliberate and willful blasphemy, yet they were still tormented endlessly with fierce fire and burning brimstone. Francis was almost overcome by these bitter visions, and she trembled with fear and horror. Yet her angelic guide and companion, Raphael, once more clasped her hand reassuringly. Fear not, beloved Francis, he said in a voice both powerful and compassionate, for what you see is but fitting justice. Never shall such scourges touch you, for you are certainly not destined for this place, but for God's golden realms of infinite glory. Upon hearing this, the saint immediately took heart, and accompanied by her guardian angel, she bravely continued her journey through hell.